And I think uh, we're about three minutes after. So, um, Alex, do you think we're okay to start with your first item or? Um... Yeah. All right. Uh, let me see if we have, uh, we're missing some folks, but it's fine. Yeah, I'll I'll share my uh, consideration. So hold on, let's give it. We'll we'll just give it like another minute then. Um, okay. And seems we should have enough time to cover things, so we'll, it's worth waiting. All right, we're at five after, so why don't we jump in? Uh, go ahead, Alex. Cool. So uh, controller runtime, the library we all love and use. Uh, we've been uh, lagging behind a little with bumping to latest. So uh, latest is uh, 0.16.2 uh, with a lot of great stuff, a lot of bugs as well. Um, most of them should be fixed by now, but we are at 0.14.6, uh, which is fine for one CDI 157, but I think that with 158, the release that's upcoming, I think we should push for upgrading and I'll, I'll give some reasons why, why that is. Um, uh, first I'll start with why we held back on upgrades, um, there's a link here to the release note for 015. It's pretty spooky. It was the biggest, uh, the largest release ever in uh, controller runtime. It was known to be a breaking release. It's uh, had a lot of bugs when it started. So I think um, bumping it uh, at the at time, it did make sense to not uh, push that forward. But right now we did get a lot of critical bug fixes in, in uh, 0.16.2, I believe. Here you can see the note from the maintainers above. Um, a note from maintainers. That, that was at the time it looked like uh, we should hold off a bit on uh, bumping. Uh, as many other projects also did uh, back when I looked at this. So um, for 157, I believe we could stay on uh, the version we're sitting at on right now, 14.6. But for the newest CDI release that should be cut this week or next week, I think we should push um, at least with maybe in Z streams, maybe in the 0, 0.0 release, we should push to have the newest and greatest and just work around anything that needs working around. Since uh, there is progress being made in control runtime, one really good thing is the rest, the default rest mapper um, that they use to um, power the cache. It is truly lazy. Um, since 015, so it would, uh, well, I'm not sure people have analyzed it, but it should um, perform better, should consume less CPU. Uh, I've seen informal analysis somewhere, but I, I don't have it included here. So that's one good thing in, in the newest versions of controller runtime. Some things that will need working around is uh, there's a helper utility around uh, optional CRDs. 
checking if an optional CRD exists. And that is totally broken right now. Um, I'm still trying to understand why it's not a bigger problem in the community, but in CDI, HPP, we kind of rely on this method. It's, uh, we, we have lots of code around, um, you know, OpenShift existing and stuff like that. So uh, that's one thing. And then the monitoring uh, stack, whether that exists or not, that's also uh, something we do. Um, yeah, that's what comes to mind and we'll have to work around that. And we also have a new behavior for the cache where it fails if uh, optional CRDs are not installed. So even with all those, or just the two of those mentioned, I still think we want to be on the latest version of controller runtime. Um, and I just wanted to get some thoughts before I start working on this. That's all. Um, yeah, I mean, that's fine. I think, yeah, I don't think we should I should do anything with 157 or with 57. Uh, it's just you have to make sure to update, you know, the Kubernetes, all the Kubernetes libs to whatever that version of controller runtime is doing as well. Yep. So just, um, it's not just controller runtime, it, you know, all, I think all the Kubernetes libraries should be updated to the version that that version of controller runtime is using. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. So which, uh, which CDI release is going to be kind of the next uh, sort of, if we could say it, long-term stable branch? Is it 157 that we're settling on for that, or is that going to be 158? Um, actually don't know if we have like a long-term support one. Um, I guess we? I'm, I, I guess I'm kind of referring to the one that, uh, that like OpenShift will use. Cause I'm just kind of thinking like, it's, is it a, is it a destabilizing, uh, change kind of right before that branch forms? Do we want to keep that on main? Um, like developing for a little bit so we have an opportunity to stabilize it uh, or is it yeah that's I mean a good to, question yeah to me I, to me I feel like this is something that um yeah like it could be a little bit late for 158 but it just depends on I think because we yeah like for example your um Vert, default vert storage class that's going into that's going to be in 158 or is that going to be in 157 that's going in 158 okay so like i think that just like thinking about feature freeze type of uh operations that are happening i know that's a little bit of a um uh like a red hat discussion but i mean i'm gonna just put the elephant in the room on that one so um it's something we should think about. Like I, for me, I think that's something that should probably happen after um, the features of 158 get cut into a branch, just as a thought, since this is like nice to have, but not necessarily and potentially destabilizing. That's just a thought for me. Yeah. I think that that was the exact rationale when we uh, lagged behind a bit with 157. We were mm -hmm. seeing what's happening with the breaking release and um, what other projects were doing. And it looked pretty scary to bump at the time. Mm -hmm. But I think right now we're already um, kind of risking never being able to catch up or it's it's going to be harder to catch up later. Or just lo losing features, that's also uh, not very positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we had that um, breathing window and with 157, but I think for 58, we, we do want to uh, get that latest and greatest. And uh, yeah, with, with the risks that's, that are involved, I still think it's worth it since a lot of features made it their way in. 
I would, uh, my vote would be to skip it for 58. Keep it, sorry? My vote would be to skip it. I don't think we, we need it um, in, in in this short time frame. Okay. But, I don't know. Especially, I guess, if, if some of the workarounds aren't quite <clears throat> figured out exactly like how we're going to uh, address them, like it might take a little bit of time to get that right, might introduce some some weird corner cases or something that it might be nice to have a little more time to uh, and a little less pressure to get uh, sorted out. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. Okay, cool. So I'll, anyone else have any thoughts on it? <clears throat> All right. Uh, I'm going to say that we decided uh, to target 159. All right. Uh, great. Thanks for bringing that one up. Um, can we jump on to the next topic? Yeah, maybe uh, Aurel's one will be a little more interesting. Okay. All right. So let's so pop back up to you after we uh, tackle the next two. So Aurel. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, currently, I'm working oh, on, a, yeah. on a task yeah. to remove the non-road feature gate, which is, which is uh, deprecated yeah, and not see. used for any uh, production code, only for some test code, mostly storage code. So here I have two examples of that. They are basically the only examples of where this uh, catches us uh, in the storage uh, test. If someone could please tell me how to change it like offline, how does this test should be changed because the non root uh, Feature gate is not set since last year, last year since October 2022. And there is another thing I wanted to raise regarding a test that is shown as successful in the JUnit file, but it's not uh, shown in the Kubert's build log, which is weird because it's a table and the second uh, entry does run. So. It's a bit peculiar. Um, I can answer regarding the second point. From my experience, the Kubert build log will uh, does not use ver verbosity, the verbosity flag uh, with Ginkgo. So any test that passes, I think, is just going to show up in the JUnit XML and not in the build log. But that may have changed and maybe actually seeing an issue. But that it used to be like that for ages. Like Kubert would only uh, print out uh, failing output during test runs. OK, but these so specific two tests two are two entries of a table. So it's kind of weird that one of them um, is printed and the other is not. And they both pass. Mm -hmm. These two, these two online six, six, three, four, and six, three, five. And it's like constant. I saw it in many PLs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I just doubt that there's issue in uh, in the J units collecting logic. That would be pretty bad. <laughs> Um, but possible. I mean, if if I kind of when I debug, I treat that JUnit file as like the source of truth. But uh, yeah, that doesn't rule out a problem in there. Uh, you can put an action item on me to answer that second question. I believe that's the next point, not this one. 
uh Aurel, or is, is that right i thought we were i thought the uh the second one here the hot plug go was the one that i clicked on here yeah that's the and this yeah. is the table that you're discussing yes yes i, I put it in two different uh, bullets one of them regard regarding the non oh, feature I... gate and the other regarding the test that is supposedly running and succeeding but it's not printed anywhere i see i see okay um right so this one six three four have i got it right yes thank you mm -hmm. um so can we jump back to the um the non-root topic as well um What does the um, non-root feature gate do nowadays anyway, since the default is not root? This feature gate does nothing. Okay. And, and since uh, this PL in a project infra, I'll just post it real quick. It's here in the chat. Since this uh, PR and the non-root feature gate is not uh, present during these tests. So I wanted to understand from you guys what to do in these cases. Do you want to remove these conditions? What do you want to do? Yeah, I mean, so I think, I don't know, I think Alexander was is out today and he's the one who would probably know for that specific test, but it would seem like we can get rid of it. Um, <clears throat> for it, is it? Sorry, go ahead. No, no, please continue. I, I was just going to ask if I'm uh, if I'm confused, but there was some discussion about um, expanding the. Well, I guess it's the the root root mode for CDI. Does that have anything to do with this, or am I um, completely? No, this is a non-root feature gate. Okay. <laughs> Which is um yeah it, it's it used to exist but it doesn't anymore like okay. it, when things used to run as root it made sense but then when we switched to non-root by default it it um... mm -hmm. okay so... so i don't mind doing the change myself if just anyone could please uh, tell me what to do or what is the meaning of the logic that is that relies on this feature gate. Okay, so if we're in non-root, then I think was this the idea that you had to um, for certain storage providers when the um, when Kubert's running is non-root, it didn't have the ability to. Um, uh, to update the permissions for a host path uh, disk, and then therefore the job couldn't run. But we must have figured out another way to solve that. These are the empty for empty disks. I don't know how that's being done. I guess maybe um, Vert Handler does have enough permissions to handle the permissions change, so it's working now. Yeah, I mean, this seems to be to me to be something that Vert Handler. Um, this is something that I think Bert Handler um, always does now. I don't know that it always used to do that, though. And Can I we really, sorry, well, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, yeah, showing the the disk image to 107 is something Bert Handler does now. Um, and I think it always used to do that. So I don't know. I don't know why it's doing this. Uh, maybe it did. Ah, maybe it, it uh, maybe it only does it. Maybe Vert Handler only does that shown when it like starts the VM for the first time. So for a hot plug, mm, uh, we'd have to make sure that it already that it was already um, owned. That would be my guess. I mean, we know that the <clears throat> config. So like, if I just look at the code, the logic that it's trying to express since 
we essentially always have non-root now if we just remove the um, the if statement around this and always executed the uh, the code inside of there because we because we have that logical uh, thing enabled. I'm just trying to decide why the test needs to. So I think uh, you know CDI didn't always uh, set the permission to 107. Mm. So if the disk, say, so say you populated a disk and it had root permission and then you hot plugged it, um, I think that could, and the VM was not running as root, that could obviously be an issue. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, with new versions of CDI, uh, that disk image is going to be owned by 107. Um, yeah, I, I I just don't think this this is. I, I think you could delete the if statement and all the code inside it, and it would work. Would be my guess. Yeah, it works because uh, for over a year now, this code is not uh, executed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Then. Yeah, just delete it. I yeah, I, and I think it makes sense because I think, uh, may, maybe at one point for like hot plug, the vert handler wasn't owning. Um, I don't know for mm -hmm. non root for hot plug disks, but and, and I don't know how long it's been a while that CDI has been uh non root, so I don't know that it's been a year, but mm -hmm. yeah, so it seems like we could. I mean, I think I think what I'm kind of hearing from this discussion is that. Yeah, if you go ahead and uh, and create a PR that changes this test in the way that we discussed and it's passing, then it seems to be all the information we need to know. I just I need the, the reasoning. Why am I removing it? You know, except for this code not uh, being executed for a year. But what is the storage logic behind it being removed? Mm hmm there <clears throat> i think a year a, a year is seems long but maybe maybe it has already been a year but for a while um there were there were cases when um and i think the normal case was that cdi would run its populator po its you know population pods as root um and kubert would and that was fine with kubert when it was running as root um, as non-root, Bert Handler started um, changing some permissions. Um, maybe initially for hot plug, um, it wasn't uh, droning. I don't know. But the, the the fact of the matter is, if you're using CDI after in, in a recent build, like from 157 at least, maybe even 156. Yeah, 156 on. Uh, the disk image is going to have be owned by 107. There's you're not going to have a disk image that was populated by CDI in a version after 156 that is not owned by 107. So it's it's redundant. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And regarding the second test that is skipped when the non root flag is. Uh... Is uh, okay, so present. Wait. So wait for first consumer. And we're skipping if non root. So we're thinking we need root. I'm just trying to see what we're. Um, what kind of storage is it? Just trying to see if. Okay, so the VM is getting started. We're creating the new uh, blank DV.
I mean, I think this is just um, sim like it's known again not to work because the I mean, what I'm looking at is because of the same reason is that this would have failed with the permission uh, in the non in the non root case. Um, Oops, why is that? I can't read. Oh, yeah, skip if non root. Um, so, like, we what this was be before vert handler was doing the uh, permission modifications before that got in. This probably wouldn't work because, um, because the permissions of the PVC wouldn't allow the VM to access it. What this function does is it checks if you have the non root feature gate. And if you do, it skips. Mm -hmm. So we don't have the non root feature gate for a year now. So is this line still correct? Or is this test still correct? It, there, again, there shouldn't be a root owned disk image. So it shouldn't happen. There should not be a root owned disk image after CDI 156. So is it okay to remove the skip? I believe so, yes. I would just move yeah, I would just remove the skip it, but let the it seems that the test case is still a reasonable like thing. So and it shouldn't really change anything, right? Yeah, because that skip isn't being triggered. Okay. All right, so it sounds like we have a plan on those. All right, um, so anything else to discuss on either of these two issues? Did we catch those? Alex is gonna look into uh, why those tests in the second uh, item are not showing up. I think we're good. Um, Yes, we are. Thank you very much. Who can I please uh, CC on the PR to check uh, review this uh, storage test changes? You can CC me. Cool. Thank you very much. Also, probably good to CC Lugo. I see uh, that the non root root feature gates to begin with. Sure. All right, sounds good. Uh, so let's jump back up to Alex, to your second uh, point about the status progress. Yep, so just uh, randomly thinking uh, why, what's the downside of Kubernetes not introducing a, a progress field that populators could just uh, keep updated to reflect the progress of the population task. I mean, we discussed it before, briefly uh, but maybe it's something we should pursue oh in the by extending the, the pvc api yeah we would have to go through the like, kubernetes cap process and stuff but yeah we'd have to extend it and also um, make sure um, that an oc get um, I don't know what's the mechanism, but make sure it prints out the progress as part of the get. Uh, like the table should contain the progress bar as well. I expect that you'd get um, that we would get a lot of pushback from that since like in general, they're trying to avoid changing the core uh, core API objects that much here. I guess one of the biggest things that I would worry about is they're going to ask what format should that progress be. And I'm not sure that anybody could agree on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think the, uh, I think the, the answer would be, well, if you care about progress, have your populator custom resource report the progress and, uh, you know, uh, don't, don't share those populator resources between, uh, existing, uh, you know, just don't share them so that it can be um, tracked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a core resource. Yeah, I already uh, kind of, I'm pushing back on myself thinking about it. 
I mean, we could we could do the in the in our populator CRs um, in the status field. We could have um, a progress field that's a um, that's a map of uh, namespace slash PVC um, like as a string, something like that, and then like whatever progress we wanted to report. So it could essentially be like a multi-value uh, progress. So basically, like any active populations that are related to that particular resource but i mean that's there'd be a weird way for people to like look up the progress because they'd have to you know list on the actual and that would actually leak other people's information yeah i think yeah i think that would be awkward yeah i think especially with cross namespace concerns yeah 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 so probably just doing the um, the annotation or something on the PVC itself is going to continue to be the simplest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyone else have thoughts on that idea? Okay. Uh, thanks for raising it. Uh, I think the last thing that we have to look at is the uh, CDI issues. So Alvaro added uh, 2926. I have that open here. Um, let's see, do we have any, uh, anyone? So it looks like Michael, you've been involved a little on the PR. Uh, do you want to, do you remember this one? Could you give us a little bit of a <clears throat> summary? Uh, this is just, um, so this user is having trouble using CDI in Azure, and it seems to be related to the uh, authentication authorization from when Cube API server talks to our um, API server that's serving up, you know, the upload resource based our extension API server. So when that happens, um, when we receive a request, we check the client cert uh, against this, ex some config map. And uh, if you scroll down, I kind of out outline um, what happens. But so yeah, we validate the 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 client cert that the Cube API server gives us against this config map and Cube system. Uh, so we, there should be a couple of CAs in there that we check and uh, validate the cert against that. That's what seems to be failing for this guy. Hmm. So, you know, um, yeah, the other thing we do is we check in this, is that is the, 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 the client cert that we got is has the right, you know, um, name in it. Um, but it, that doesn't seem to be an issue, or at least that's an issue that you can easily get around. So yeah, I, I mean, I don't, and as far as I, I tried to, I think, um, say how these parameters are set, um, if you scroll up, um, but this is, he's using AKS, which is like a managed Kubernetes thing. So I'm not sure that, you know, what options are available for that. So mm -hmm. yeah, like I said, the Cube API server, our proxy client cert file uh, and, and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it, it seemed it would seem that their cluster is misconfigured in some way, uh, in some non-standard. It's configured in some non-standard way where we're just rejecting requests from. Okay. Cube API server. Okay, so uh, like I guess my first major concern would this be a generalized issue with trying to run on Azure? Um, so so like... yeah, I mean if you scroll down, someone it, it worked at least at one point. Uh, if you scroll down, there so there were issues with AKS in the past that were discussed and fixed. So like if you look at the, the previous issues, like mm -hmm. and, the, and the fix, like it, I remember working with this guy to 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 get it working. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Okay. So I think we have some testing on uh, I guess. Um, actually, I am not sure. It might be like Red Hat internal. 
or that OpenShift CI thing where you could just specify if you want GC GCP or. Yeah, um, but I think that doesn't use AKS. I mean, that will, I think, provision nodes and then install um, that way. Mm -hmm. Run like OpenShift installer. So, yeah, I, you know, yeah, it seems to me that um, the, the cluster is just not configured right. Okay. Because if you scroll up, you'll see that he somehow got, you know, see, he did a verify himself and it says verification failed. So mm. if he got, if he, he got access to the, the cert and validated, so. Well, it's a self-signed certificate. Is that uh, an issue? Is that the actual failure reason? <clears throat> uh, that would be uh, a good reason. Well, I mean, I don't think that's a failure in itself. Um, as long as we have the 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 cert. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what's happening with this? I guess he, yeah. He asked you for some info. So you got. It seems like you're pretty active on the on the issue right now. So um, there's some engagement back and forth there. So in terms of what we need to do in this forum, it's probably just let um, let this run its course as you've been already working with them. Um, is that right? Or do we are we going to be trying to close it? Or it seems like we, it's too early to close it because there's some active collaboration happening. I mean, again, I, I've never uh, configured these certs in the system myself. I can just say these are the values we read from that config map. Um, mm -hmm. You can try updating it yourself. I've yeah. Kind of already laid that out. So, um, okay. So I'd say let's kind of leave this open. Um, you know, he's trying to work through it. Maybe we'll get some more information as he continues to uh, as he continues to debug his environment. Um, okay, so then is that basically there was one more that you linked uh, below Alvaro? Is this the only other one that we need to look at? Yeah. Okay. So the read write once pod for data volumes. Yeah, so uh, the issue description uh, is more about the validation just going through. We currently reject them, mm -hmm. simply reject them. But when we discussed this, um, supporting this, we realized we might need like uh, additional steps to support it properly. Uh, one, one problem that could occur is with wait for first consumer, we'd have a target read, write one spot PVC. Um, and once something's consuming that PVC, we cannot anymore schedule our expansion pods or actually, I think the expansion pod is the only, um, the only scenario where this is a problem, but we could schedule it, right? I, I, it just wouldn't run. That, yeah, I don't think that there's ever. I mean, yeah, you can. I mean, there may be slight overlap. Like, it's supposed to be a serialized process. Like, we pop, we populate the, um, the PVC in one. Uh, well. When do we actually run the expansion pod now? That's during cloning, right? Yeah. Um, so we we do the expansion pod when we're even smart cloning. So there's not even any pods uh, used. With dumb clones, we don't do the expansion pod. Yeah, but there's the uh, user's target pod, like the first consumer, that could be the vert launcher, for example, with wait for first consumer. Well, so with populators, that, that's a non-issue. Um, yeah, I, okay, I see, yeah. With, because the, it's, the expansion pod will run on PVC prime or... Um, right, 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 right. And then even with data volumes, if you're using data volumes, you should be watching the data volume status before creating the pod. 
Um, um I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure that's what I mean. You would have to schedule something to kickstart the whole thing. No. So you start you'll start the VM and Vert Controller will check any data volumes to see if there are any data volumes that aren't succeeded, it will wait for them to succeed before creating Vert Launcher. Mm -hmm. So if you're, uh, yes, I mean, it's possible, like anyone can create a pod on a, a PVC, but uh, if you're using the data volume for synchron, if you know, you're using the data volume for synchronization, you should be waiting till it succeeded. And if you're using populators, you've been extra protected because PVC prime is the one that's um, mm -hmm. being uh, mutated. Mm -hmm. Right, and yes. actually, if if we were allowing concurrent uh, pods to be running while multiple things are editing the disk image, we'd be corrupting it, wouldn't we? So, like, it must be working. Um, so it must be serializing properly already in general. Yeah, it, it, yeah. If you're using data volumes and you wait for it to be succeeded before creating a pod, you should be safe. Um, with populators, again, I think you're safe too because uh, the the target won't be bound until uh, the expansion is done. So I think the real question here, like we're we generally aren't even recommending read write once. Like we want people to use read write many. Um, so like you can use, of course, you can use read write once if you have to. Um, read write once pod is like a little bit more restrictive, I guess, but um, it shouldn't be a really big deal. So I, I guess it should work. But the question is like, do we then want to expand testing for something that like, we don't really see a, a valid reason to use? I mean, I guess we could just like relax the validation and have like a very simple test that end to end it works correctly but like for yeah. us there's for us there's no reason unless there's a store a weird storage that we don't know about or mm -hmm. something that that the, works better the the main area i think would be affected uh and we'll probably want to test on is if a clone source if you're doing a dumb clone and uh the pvc is read write once pod it can only have, um, yeah, we can create the pods, but it will uh, be serialized. Because mm -hmm. right now, uh, um, yeah, we'll, we'll create concurrent pods that we, I think, discussed in some issue last week. Mm -hmm. So but I mean, from, it's not, I don't think there's anywhere in our code that we'll ever look at uh, if, you know, mode equals root type once pod do something special. Like, I don't think yeah. that would ever exist. But we will be affected. It, um, mm -hmm. That's the only reason, that's the only way I can think that we'll be affected at the end of it. And I guess what I'd also say is like, this is sort of a, like, it feels like a theoretically good thing to add, but not necessarily, there's nothing driving this. Like I haven't heard of anyone saying like, I really want to use read write once pod. Why don't you guys support it? So in like, in terms of like picking battles, this one to me isn't necessarily like, yes, it feels cleaner to say, yeah, we support all the access modes that you can use on a PVC. Of course, that feels cleaner, but, you know, I don't know that it's... Uh, I mean, I think it's kind of nice. Um, gives you, yeah. it would make me feel a little warm and fuzzier. Yeah, personally. Yep, that's fair. That's you fair. know, uh, yeah. So I think if we're gonna allow this, we'd have to, yeah, we'd have to think about um, at least one or two tests. I mean, we probably need a um, an upload test, a, clone, a dumb clone test, and 
uh, for completeness an import test, but I don't think we want to like uh, proliferate this uh, access mode throughout the rest of the like permutations of test cases. Like just sort of a basic uh, smoke test of it, if you will. And then like if we run into issues down the line where people use it, then we can add additional test cases as needed. I wonder why David opened it to begin with. Like, what's the what, what was he seeing? I just want to make sure we're not missing a use case for this. I mean, I think he's come coming at it with the context of the um of the Kubevert CSI driver, and that if that's providing PVCs to an upper layer, um like in that upper layer wants to use that access mode, then we would want to allow it to happen at the kubevert CSI level. Does that make sense? So just more of like, cause the, if you're doing like nested um, Kubernetes clusters or something like that with kubevert CSI, the nested cluster doesn't really care that CDI is there or that anything is, is existing there. It just wants the, the mode that it wants. Yeah. So that's probably what it is, just you know, maximum compatibility. Which is probably a good enough reason to to do it in of itself. All right, so I think the conclusion, I'm gonna just add a note, like, um, like I'm gonna say like, uh, no pressing, oops, uh, reason to add this, but uh, would be nice to have for maximum compatibility and completeness. We would need to add at least a couple of smoke tests to make sure that there are no surprises. I mean, I think that summarizes the discussion there. Like, no reason not to, but okay. Um, right. Anything else uh, at the end of the meeting? We don't have any other agenda items on here. Um, any open floor topics? All right. Uh, silence says everything. So I think we're finished for today. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Have a great week, and we'll see you back here in two weeks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.